And um, before we get started, why don't we just start out with a word of prayer. Praise God. Lord, we thank you once again for your precious love. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. God, we pray that uh, the gift of faith would begin to operate in this house. Pray, God, a spirit of liberty, O oh God, would come upon your people right now as I speak these words. God, I ask that you would do whatever it takes to draw us closer to you this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Praise God. All right, I came across, I came across a uh, very interesting scripture here in Psalm 68, verses 3 and 4. Praise God. <clears throat> it says, Let the uncomprisingly righteous be glad. Let them be in high spirits and glory before God. Yes, let them jubilantly rejoice. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Cast up a highway for him who rides through the desert. His name is the Lord. Be in high spirits and glorify be glory before him. But I, I want you to notice something here. It says, sing praises to his name. Cast up a highway for him. So... When we praise God, we are actually building a highway for God to travel on. Praise God. So that's how he's able to inhabit the praises of his people. So why don't we start out this morning by praising him. Praise God. Hallelujah. God, we thank you, Lord, for your precious love today. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Oh, God, you're so precious God, you're so caring. You love us beyond the love that we can comprehend. Hallelujah. You have great compassion upon your people. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you. Oh, hallelujah. We glorify you. We give thanks to you. Hallelujah. We speak your matchless holy name before you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, hallelujah. We love you today, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. <clears throat> So as I began to prepare for this uh, Bible study, I uh, began to seek the Lord and ponder in my mind what I was going to talk about. And uh, four words came into my mind. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And those are the four words right there. The danger of unbelief. Now God is the... Alpha and the Omega, the Bible says. He knows the beginning from the end. Praise God. So he knows all about our future. He knows what's waiting for each of us down the road. God will, sp will speak prophetic words to us about the wonderful things that he's going to do in our lives, things that are in store for us. But he will always also speak words of warning to us when we're approaching something that may be a danger to us. So that's what I believe is taking place this morning. God is warning us to be aware of the danger of unbelief. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now the devil works through deception. Revelation 12, 9 tells us that. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. If we go on to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, this tells us how he's going to bring this deception about. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. So what the Bible is saying here is that this is not something that might happen. This is something that's going to happen. As a matter of fact, it's something that's already happening. Praise God. So it says in this passage that people will not endure sound doctrine. Well, I mean, that's a, a polite way of saying they're going to reject the truth. So 
there has to be something working behind the scenes that's causing these things to take place. And I believe that, so that something is the deception of the enemy. People will think they're believing the truth when in fact they'll be believing a lie. Hallelujah. Now there's some things that we need to understand about deception. Deception is not something that's in your face kind of thing. Deception is very subtle. As a matter of fact, it's so subtle that most people won't even realize it's taking place. The Bible calls the devil a serpent. Now, did you ever watch how a serpent operates? How it catches its prey? It will slither up on its prey completely undetected, and it'll use its surrounding as a, as a camouflage. Then when the prey is completely vulnerable, it will attack and inject its venom into that prey. Praise God. And that's exactly how the enemy works with us. <clears throat> His first step is to bring doubt into our mind about God's word. Now, do you, uh, do you remember what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? I think we all do. God gave a commandment to Adam in Genesis 2.16. We could go there. And the Lord... God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. <clears throat> now, if you read the rest of this chapter, you'll see that God creates Eve, but he doesn't say any, it doesn't say anything about God speaking the, this commandment to Eve. So I don't know if God spoke that commandment to her, or if he... Uh, was given uh, Adam the responsibility to pass that commandment on to her. I don't know what transpired. But whatever took place, you can see that there was confusion in the mind of Eve about exactly what God said, as we will see. For when the serpent questions her in chapter 3, verse 1, <clears throat> says, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So there's two things taking place here. <clears throat> first, the serpent, the first thing he does is tries to interject doubt into her mind by saying, has God indeed said? So he's, you know, he's basically saying to her, are you sure that's what he said? He's trying to plant that seed of doubt there. <clears throat> then he misquotes God's word when he said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. God said, you shall not eat of one tree. So Eve's confusion became apparent when she attempted to answer in, uh, in uh, verse 2. Praise God. It says, We may not eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So you can see what's going on here, because God never said not to touch it. So... Eve wasn't really sure exactly what God was saying. And now verse 4 begins to show us the true nature of the serpent. When he said to the woman, you will not surely die. So we all know that God said you will die. So he was basically saying that whatever God told you just wasn't true. That shows the level of his rebellion. Praise God. So... After he saw how Eve responded to him in doubt and confusion, he moved in to set the hook. So the next step was to move her thoughts from doubt to unbelief. Praise God. So let me stop here just for a moment and look at what the difference is between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is not the absence of faith. Doubt is the questioning of faith. <clears throat> so you can only doubt something that you already believe. So doubt can operate in the presence of faith. Amen? And it's part of the struggle that we all go through. But unbelief is much deeper than that. A doubt is questioning what you believe. And I don't believe God is offended when we question him about his word. I know I've done it many times. But that's where faith comes in. When we have a question, we come to God 
And faith will kick in at that point. Faith will always lead us in the right direction. Any questions that we have, God will resolve if we'll put our trust in him. So faith is the language of the kingdom of God. Amen? But unbelief, on the other hand, is when someone refuses to believe. Unbelief will always lead to spiritual blindness and a stubborn resistance to God. Let me repeat that. Unbelief will always lead to spiritual blindness and a stubborn resistance to God. So that's exactly what the, what the serpent was doing with Eve. His plan was to move her from doubt to unbelief. And as you continue to read in the scripture, you'll see that the serpent was successful. <clears throat> the Bible says that she took of the fruit that was forbidden for her to partake of and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, Adam, and he ate. Now, if Adam and Eve would have believed God's word, they never would have eaten of the fruit. But they did. So that exposed their unbelief. So the human race fell from grace because of one act of unbelief. <clears throat> and did you know that faith and unbelief can exist in the same house? Now, if you read first and second chapter of Job, you'll see this whole thing play out in the life of Job and his wife. The Bible tells us that the devil came against Job and his family, but he did so with God's permission. So in one day's time, this is hard to, hard to understand, but in one day's time, Job lost his wealth, his health, and all of his children. Job's wife now responded from a position of unbelief when she told Job to curse God and die in chapter 2, verse 9. But Job, on the other hand, responded from a position of faith in verse 10. He said, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So you can see here they responded in completely different ways to the same situation because of what they chose to believe or what they chose to not believe. <clears throat> so now if you study the Bible, you'll see that there's more to unbelief than merely rejecting God's word. If you read Revelation 21.8, praise God, it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually moral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So God is equating those who practice unbelief with murderers and sorcerers. Praise God, that's something we need to listen to very carefully. But why does God judge unbelief so harshly? I believe the answer can be found in 1 Chronicles, 21st chapter. Praise God. We all know what happened in this chapter, I believe. Uh, David decides to number the nation of Israel. <clears throat> now, by looking at that face value, you think, well, what's the big deal there? He's just finding out how many troops he has. But he was numbering the, the uh, nation of Israel to see how strong his army was. He was putting his trust in military might rather than God. So he doubted or he didn't believe that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. Verse 1 tells us why he did what he did. It says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. <clears throat> so we can see here that Satan was operating behind the scenes and that's when God's judgment fell. So a plague, the Bible says that a plague caused 70,000 men to die because of this one act of unbelief. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here, just as faith is the language of the kingdom of God, unbelief is the language of the kingdom of darkness. That's why unbelief is so dangerous. You're giving voice to that demonic realm. And what's even worse unbelief will quench or block God's will for your life. So we got to be very careful and not allow that into our mind, into our thought process. 
<clears throat> and I know that there's Christians who think, well, I've got faith. I don't have to worry about unbelief taking root, uh, root in my heart. But let me just tell you something that happened to me. <clears throat> I had a very close friend when I first came into the church, and uh, we did everything together. And he eventually became a pastor, and he was a pastor for 17 years. <clears throat> and uh, I would say it was around 2002 I moved away, and then we sort of lost touch with each other. And recently I heard that this man who was on fire for God, who was a pastor for 17 years, was no longer in the church. I mean, it, it broke my heart when I heard that because we were close. And, you know, how, why did that happen to him? I believe he allowed the seeds of unbelief to grow in his heart. So we have to make sure that we protect ourselves from this. We have to understand that we're not immune to that sort of thing happening to us. Praise God. So if you read the 8th chapter of Luke, you'll find a ruler, Jairus, is who had a 12-year-old daughter who had just died. And this scripture here shows us how Jesus handled unbelief. Verse 50. This tells us of Jesus' response when he finds out that the girl was dead. He said, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. Verse 52 goes on to say, praise God. Would you go to 52? Yeah, there you go. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And verse 53 tells us how the crowd reacted. Verse 53 says, and they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. So we can see here that the voice of unbelief will always mock and ridicule the voice of faith. Amen? So verse 54 says how Jesus responded to that ridicule. First thing he did is he put them all outside. He removed them. And then he took her by the hand saying, little girl, arise. Praise God. So he completely ignored what they had said. So the, then it tells us in verse 55 that the spirit returned and she arose immediately. So how did, hand, how did Jesus handle unbelief? He first ignored it and then he removed it. So that's, that's what we need to do when the enemy tries to put thoughts of unbelief in our mind. We need to ignore what he's saying and then we need to remove it. Amen? So... As that miracle took place now, this is, this is happening in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Praise God. All right, chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So, I mean, now this happened immediately after what had just taken place with this girl being risen from the dead. So I believe that God was allowing his disciples to move into a higher level of faith at this point. Because now they knew how to handle unbelief. I, didn't, I don't think they handled unbelief very well up until this point. But when Jesus showed them how he handled it, then they understood so I believe that when we learn how to handle unbelief, God will also take us to a higher level. Amen? Praise God. So what is the remedy or the antidote for unbelief? I know that most people would say, well, of course, it's faith, right? But unbelief cannot work when faith man until faith manifests itself. I'm sorry. Unbelief cannot work. When faith manifests itself, that's true, but something else must come first, and I believe that something is revelation. Amen? Now, revelation, revelation is when God reveals something to us 
that has been previously hidden. And it, and it is an individual thing. What something may be hidden from me may, might not be something that's hidden from you. So revelation, we can receive revelation through God's word, or we can receive revelation through him speaking directly to us. In Romans 10, 16, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So in order for Isaiah to ask that question, he had to have run into somebody that didn't believe. Amen? But then he gives us the remedy in the very next verse, in verse 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But what, what does the word of God bring? It brings revelation. Amen? Now, the, the best example that I can give of, of revelation producing faith in someone is, is my own self. Um, in 1991, I was not living for God. I, ha I was a heavy drinker at that point for probably over 20 years. And I didn't, uh, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't reading God's word. I wasn't praying. I was very far away from God at that point in my life. <clears throat> but I had a praying mother. Now, this is just my opinion now, but I believe a praying mother is the most powerful thing in the kingdom of God. Praise God. I mean, if you're a praying mother, don't stop praying. Praise God. But, hallelujah. My mother was became very ill at that point. And uh, I really didn't know how much longer she was going to be on this earth. So I, uh, I went to her every night after work. I was a mailman in Milwaukee. <clears throat> and every night I would get off like at 4 o'clock and I would go over to where she was in the hospital and I would sit by her bedside and try to give her some kind of comfort. <clears throat> and uh, she had Parkinson's disease. Her throat was completely paralyzed. She couldn't speak a word and she would choke on her own saliva. That's, that's the condition that she was in. <clears throat> so I'm sitting by her bedside, right? And here this, this little frail woman begins to speak words. She be, begins to speak powerful words, only it wasn't in English. And I couldn't understand what was happening to her. So I ran and got the nurse and said, something's happening with my mother. I think she's delirious. She's talking out of her head. <clears throat> the nurse came back, and she didn't really understand what was going on with her either. So anyway, I was there at 4.30 that night. I stayed till 12.30 that, that night past midnight, and my mother had spoke like that for eight straight hours. And then the next morning, she passed away. So that, that really affected me. I don't know how you can explain that. But that really affected me. <clears throat> now, my sister knew that I was close to my mother, so she, she was living in Illinois. She invited me to come down to Illinois just to stay with her until my mother's funeral. I mean, I had to get all that stuff together, you know, to bury her. So I came down to her house. She had a spare bedroom. I, I went into the bedroom that night. I kneeled down for the first time in like 20 years, and I prayed a simple prayer. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I said, God, you know how, how my close my mother was with you, and that's all she talked about was you. And I said, if, if she's with you now, I want you to send me a sign. <laughs> Praise God. So I, I went to bed that night. Not thinking anything about it, I woke up the next morning, well, about 7 o'clock in the morning, and I went in and took a shower, came out of the shower, and I heard this strange noise outside the house, and I couldn't understand what it was. So I came out to the patio door. She had 
sliding patio doors, and I saw thousands upon thousands of birds landing around my sister's house. This went on for several minutes until an area of, I would say, two acres, the ground was completely covered with birds. You could not take a step without stepping on a bird. I mean, that's how many of these birds came. And they all just sat there. And I'm sitting there looking at this, thinking, this is really strange. I've never seen this happen before. <clears throat> so I opened the door, and suddenly I realized that I had prayed a prayer the night before for God to send me a sign. So I stepped out onto the patio, and I looked up to heaven, and I said, God, is this the sign? And the very instant I spoke those words, <clears throat> the power of God came upon me like I'd never felt before in my life. And it went through my body, and God spoke to me, and he said, this is the sign that you asked me for. Praise God. Hallelujah. So then I went back to Wisconsin after that, not knowing what to do. I was like, I didn't know if I was foot or horseback. I mean, I was confused. I thought, what am I supposed to do now? God just spoke to me. And, and uh, praise God. So I go back to Wisconsin, find out that there's a, there's a church, several churches that I was going to go to in, in when I got back. But um, this man that I was working with, he came over to me, to my, uh, he, was a, he was also a mailman. He came over to me and asked me if I wanted to go to dinner that night with him and his wife at his house. And I, you know, I didn't know if I should or I shouldn't. So I said, yeah, I, sure, I'll go. So then uh, I get over to his house <clears throat> and uh, he's, he, we finished dinner and he goes, would you like to read the Bible? And I thought, well, that's a peculiar thing for him to say. And I didn't understand that this man was a minister in a, in a church. He was an outreach minister. And I didn't know that. And he said, after he, and he's talking about, he said, if you repent of your sins and you're baptized in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he says, and when that happens to you, you're going to speak in a heavenly language in another tongue. Now, I didn't say anything to him at this point, but I'm thinking in my mind, I wonder if that's what happened to my mother. And the very instant I thought that thought, the power of God, just like what happened to me when I first experienced it in Illinois, it came into this man's living room and hit this man. He pointed his finger at me and he said, and he didn't know my mother from Adam. And he says, and your mother received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. The night before she died. So I ended up going to church, got baptized in Jesus' name. I repented of my sins. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. And then I began to speak in tongues just like I saw my mother speak. Praise God. Praise God. So I went from complete unbelief in a, in a degenerate mind to a, a, a person that I knew at this point that God loved me and he cared for me and I had unshakable faith at that point. So it totally, completely turned my life around. So why do we want to receive revelation? I believe God has a plan for each of us. Amen? God knows what we need. He knows our weaknesses. If we're struggling with something, maybe even for years, God can give us revelation and straighten that out in five seconds. Amen? So God longs to speak to us. God longs to work through us. But receiving, we got to understand that when you receive revelation from God, it's a powerful thing. It's a life-changing thing. <clears throat> so... When we receive something from God, if we receive revelation from him, he doesn't want us to keep it to ourselves. He, wanna, he wants us to release it into other people's lives also. Amen? So how do we put ourselves in a position to receive revelation from God? I think if we look at an example of the Apostle Paul, he was a man who received more revelation than anyone in the New Testament. 
Now we know him as the Apostle Paul, but his name was Saul when he first when we first come upon him in chapter nine of of uh, Acts. Amen. So it says, um, let's just see how God brought revelation to him. And the Bible tells us that Saul was causing huge problems for God's people at this point. So if you look at his conversion, you can actually see the steps that God took with this man to turn him around. So it begins in Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And he, Saul, journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. So here God uses the brightness of his light to separate Saul from the influence of the world. Praise God. Now, in Saul's case, God used a bright light. <clears throat> but God can use anything to get our attention. Amen? In my case, he used the death of my mother. I mean, that... That is what eventually separated me completely from the world. Now, the next thing we can see in verse 4, it says, Then he fell to the ground. Praise God. So here God knocks him to the ground. You know, he was a, a man most likely filled with pride. Guess what? God was humbling him right here. <laughs> he knocks him to the ground. So we, in this process of receiving revelation... We need to be separated from the world. And we can see here that humility is part of this also. <clears throat> the next thing we see is he heard in a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Praise God. So the next step in this process is to hear the voice of God. Amen. So God can speak to us in many different ways. I mean, how he speaks to you may be different than how he speaks to me. But he'll always speak to us in the way that we can understand him. And he'll speak to us um, in a way that will be uh, just for us. It'll be personal. Amen? So the next step we can see here in verse 5, and he said, Who are you, Lord? Saul, wanted, Saul obviously wanted to know who it was that was speaking to him. He was questioning the source of where that was coming from. <clears throat> but doesn't the Bible tell us that we're supposed to test the spirits? So he was doing something scriptural and he didn't even realize it. Praise God. So the next step in the process is also seen in verse 5 when the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So here Saul was confirming who it was that was speaking to him. Or should I say he was receiving confirmation from the Lord. So when a voice speaks to us, we need to know who that voice is <clears throat> before we receive anything. Praise God. So the next step in verse 6, it says, So he, trembling and astonished, said, What do you want me to do? So you can see here at this point, Saul is completely broken and surrenders himself in complete submission. So we can see from this scripture that submission is part of that process all also. Amen. <clears throat> so lastly, after all of that took place in his life now, Saul waits for God's words of instruction, which were arise and go into the city. Praise God. And you will be told what you must do. Praise God. So if, if we are to receive revelation from God, at some point, God will tell us what we need to do. Amen? Praise God. And we have to understand that. So here the Bible lays it all out for us. <clears throat> In order for us to receive revelation from God, we need to separate ourselves from the world. We need to humble ourselves. We need to wait for God to speak to us. We need to identify who it is speaking to us. Then we need to wait for confirmation and make sure that it's God speaking to us. We need to offer our complete submission to God's will and then wait for God's instructions. Amen? So if we do these things, we'll put ourselves in a position to receive revelation. But one thing I've found over the years 
In most cases, God will pursue us in the beginning. I mean, I think we all understand that. When we came to God in the first, when we first came to him, uh, he, he pursued us. He came after us. And we can see that receiving revelation at that point can bring repentance, baptism, you know, the infilling of the Holy Ghost in our life. <clears throat> and God will continue to work with us and impart wonderful, wonderful things into our life at that point. We can even see visions and dreams. We can have encounters with God's angels. All those things can take place when God moves in on us. But however, this is something that I've learned over the years. At some point, God is going to back off from us. And this is where some people don't understand about how God works, <clears throat> which can cause them to question God. So after God backs off from us now, then he waits for us to pursue him. In Jeremiah 29, 29, 29, 13 explains this perfectly. It says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amen. Praise God. So just as God pursued us in the beginning, he waits for us to pursue him. Praise God. Now, this is something that if we get this, this is going to drastically affect our relationship with God. Praise God. So if we want the spirit of revelation to operate in our life, we have to ask for it. <clears throat> the Bible says that we have not because we ask not. Amen. So we need to ask God. So that's what I feel we need to do this morning. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, gives us a perfect example of, of uh, how to pray in this area. So we got to remember that when we receive revelation from God, it must line up with his word. If it doesn't line up with his word, then we need to reject it. Amen? <clears throat> so this is Paul's prayer for the saints. So now just imagine that, the, how far Paul has come at this point. We just read about him being knocked down on the road to Damascus, and now he's praying a prayer for the saints of God. It says that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance to the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. Praise God. So what I would like to do this morning is if we could all stand. Let's pray for God to give, that, give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because there's... There, there's a lot of things that God wants to do in this city. And if he can impart revelation to us, it can, it can drastically change our life. Amen? So let's pray that now. Praise God. Lord, you th we thank you once again for your precious love. God, you're a God that desires to speak to his people. You desire, God, to give us things of your kingdom, Lord. You desire to impart your gifts to us. You desire to impart understanding to us, O oh God. Oh, hallelujah. So you see us here all today, Lord, in this house. Hallelujah. God, there's a mighty work that has to be done in this city, Lord. Hallelujah. And we need your strength, God. We need your wisdom. We need your understanding. Oh, hallelujah. So we ask you this morning, Lord, if you would impart that spirit of revelation to us, oh God, oh hallelujah. We ask you, Lord, to speak to your people, God, oh hallelujah. God, this morning, right now, oh Lord, speak to your people in this house, oh God. Give us direction, God, hallelujah. Give us the wisdom that we need to accomplish your purpose in this place, oh Lord, oh hallelujah. God, I know that this is in your will to ask for this to pray for this. So we're doing it right now, God. Hallelujah. We're in unity here, Lord. Hallelujah. God, we're, 
we're going to come against that kingdom of darkness right now. We reject that doubt. We reject that unbelief in Jesus' name. We rebuke every spirit that would come into this house and try to bring unbelief into our lives right now. Hallelujah. And we pray, God, that your spirit of revelation would come into this place with such power, hallelujah, that it would change our outlook as to how we look at our life and what we need to do for you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will let us receive it now. Hallelujah. Help us to receive it, God, right now in Jesus name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you, if you want to receive something from him now, right now, raise your hands. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Help us, Lord. Help us, dear Jesus, to receive what we need from you. Oh God. Oh God. I know you want us to do a mighty work, oh Lord, in these last days, God. But we need your touch. We need your revelation to accomplish that purpose. Hallelujah. Let your most precious blessings, God, be upon your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We plead your blood, oh God, over every person here this morning. Thank you, precious Lord. Hallelujah.